Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 154, My Teacher, Atlas, Bearing the Weight of Game Teaching. I'm here, but it's not just me. We've got the Tabletop Bellhop himself as well. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. This week, we've got a detailed question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Roger Dodd, talking about the burden of being a game teacher. After that, we finally got a review of Aventuria, Forest of No Return, the first cooperative adventure expansion for the Aventuria adventure card game. Finally, we've got our usual weekend review, including more plays of Land vs. Sea, Super Motherload with four, and the first plays of This Didn't Happen and Star Trek Expeditions. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Let's start off with a quick comment from our friend Brian from Brains on Games on our topic of stuffing a Kallax with family games. Simple one, great idea. Well, thanks, Brian. I always want to read his Brian on games. Whenever Brian's on games, whenever I see his thing, but Brian's on games. Brian's a fantastic Canadian content creator who talks about games from an educational insight. Um, he is a some type of psychologist, and will actually talk about the various skills you learn by playing different games. And I got to say, family friendly games is definitely perfect for your audience. So, Brian, feel free, steal it, stuff your own Calyx. We won't mind. Next. Brock Wagner watched our Aw Shucks coverage and commented, I just got my copy of Four Gardens yesterday. I think it's Wager. It's not, definitely it not Wager? Wagner. Okay. I think it's Wager, but it might be Wagger. I think it's Wager. I thought that was a typo, because don't we have oh. Brock Wagner usually the guy who comments to us all the time? Yeah, but it's Brock Wager. There's no N. Oh, okay. I apologize, Brock, then. Four Gardens. Four Gardens is the one we highlighted with the giant pagoda thing that turned and twisted and stuff. And I got to say that and the not the beast. I always want to say the beast because that's an RPG, a single player journaling RPG. Just beast. That and beast are the two games from Oshucks that definitely caught my attention. And I hope you dig Four Gardens and I would love to hear your thoughts on it, Brock. Next, we're back to Quacks of Quedlinburg with Theodore Theorl, who wrote, Quacks is a great game got both expansions, the BGG rounded bottom bags, and put all the chits into coin capsules so they don't wear out. My kids enjoy playing it very much. Yeah, upgrading Quacks is uh, definitely on my board game to-do list at some point. Um, I think I may actually bite the bullet and go with the upgraded ingredients instead of using coin capsules. Um, while the coin capsule thing works good, it just doesn't look as cool as nice little plastic pieces. New bags, though, is something else I would like to get. And I got to say, those round-bottomed ones on Board Game Geek that Theodore mentions are really nice. I took a look at them, and they actually feature artwork of the ingredients on the outside edge. Like, they're screen-printed. They're, they're like, nice quality-looking bags. And they're the type that has a round bottom instead, so nothing gets stuck in the corners. Someday, maybe. Thank you for the comment, Theodore. Next, a quick comment on Roll Camera. Mal, a.k.a. Malachi Ray Rempen, says, Wow, great review. Thanks for the write-up. Now, for those who may have missed it during our review, Mal is actually the designer of Roll Camera, and it's awesome that they took the time to review the review and comment. Thank you, Mal. Finally, More Coffee dropped a comment on our topic of high school games last week to say, this is indeed a great topic. I agree with a lot of your picks, and the ones where I don't immediately go, great shout, it's because purely I, because I don't know the game. Now, other suggestions from me would be Cluster, Dexterity with Magnets, Coop, which we did talk about in the, uh, after, in the lobby quite a bit, uh, for a more challenging variant of Love Letter, and of course, Oink Games, Deep Sea Adventure, Fake Artist Goes to New York, All You Actually Need is Different Colored Pencils and Paper to Draw On, Startups, Nine Tiles Panic, Scout, and these are just the Oink Games I've tried. Oh, thanks, More Coffee. Um, for a long time, I thought More Coffee was More Coffee Gaming from Windsor, but I can't see More Coffee Gaming from Windsor being this um, invested in Oink Games. So I actually <laughs> think it's someone different, which is awesome, because I just thought it was someone we know locally who was commenting. So uh, 
apologies to more coffee for thinking you were somewhere else though he's a really cool guy so it's not like a bad thing um thanks for these suggestions some great ones here the oint games in particular sound like they'd be awesome they come in these really small boxes and i've yet to play any of them mainly because i've never found them for sale in person and the online prices are i, I would go so far as to say ridiculous for what you get now, what I will do is toss links to all of these games in the show notes so those of you at home can check them out yourself. Now, finally, let's leave off on a very positive note with this tweet from Grand Gamers Guild. At Tabletop Bellhop, thank you for all the kind words about Roll Camera and all the time, love, and attention you gave to it. I'm honored to represent it in North America. Well, thanks a lot for that. Um, I got to say, Mark, you've got another hit on your hands here. I don't know if it's better than Garento. Garento is hard to top, but it's a very different style of game. So I think everyone needs to own both because, you know, if you're playing an abstracty and you're competitive, you play Garento. But if you want to work together, you play Roll Camera. I honestly don't mind at all spreading the word about this great game. And speaking of Roll Camera, we should probably move on to our announcements. A couple of announcements before we get to our main topic tonight. So first off, a reminder that our roll camera review and giveaway is still going strong. As of right now, there are two weeks left to enter, a bit less for those of you listening to the audio version of this podcast. For this contest, we've got one copy of the retail edition of Roll Camera that we're willing to ship anywhere in Canada and the continental U.S. To enter, all you got to do is head over to the blog, check out our roll camera review, and enter using the raffle copter widget at the bottom of the page. As a thanks, for those of you who joined us here live on Twitch tonight, we've just dropped a bonus entry code in the chat. Next up, I'm pleased to announce a second giveaway, this time for a digital game with a dungeon crawling theme that could have easily been a board game. Head to the blog and enter to win a Steam code for a copy of Guild of Dungeoneering Ultimate Edition. Now, this giveaway will be open the day this podcast goes live. So those of you in the chat, you don't have to run away right now. It'll go live on Tuesday, November the 16th. Now, Guild of Dungeoneering is a very cool roguelike dungeon builder doing things a bit different from other digital card games. This is a fun romp of a roguelike deck builder where you're not only improving your own deck, but building your guild hall and even building the dungeons themselves. Mm -hmm in a very old school dungeon pencil sketch aesthetic as you drop down pieces of dungeon, monsters, and even the loot that you'll have to collect and deal with along the way. The soundtrack is a nice light distraction from the slaughter you're sending the dungeoneers into <laughs> and the bard telling tales of adventure after each edition or run is a fun aspect, but also able to be turned off if it gets a little repetitive to you. Now, as you'd expect from a roguelike, it's tough enough that you're not just barreling through one dungeon after another, and you do need to think about your progress and plan how much scrounging to do with what dungeoneer before sending them off to meet their maker. I mean, the next boss fight. Now, since there's no shipping needed for this one, we are happy to open our Guild of Dungeoneering giveaway to the entire world. All you need to enter is an email address and, well, access to Steam, because it will be a Steam code. We've got not one, but two codes to give out for this digital game. Enter on the, now on the blog or starting uh, when this Tuesday. goes live on Tuesday. Wait, wait, did the lobby just ask for a bonus code for this one? Oh, you're going to have to wait because it's not live yet. Maybe you may want to join us next week. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Windsor Area Game Designer, Roger Malosh, better known as Roger Dodger, who wrote in with this detailed series of questions about game teaching. Roger writes, hey, Mo and Sean, I once did a playtest where I displayed a QR code on my phone with a link to the rules for my game. Everyone scanned it and read the rules on their phones. After a few minutes, I answered a few questions and clarified a rule or two. We then all started playing the game and it went like clockwork. Wouldn't it be great if it always happened this way? <laughs> Generally, however, the responsibility of deciphering and explaining the rules falls on one person in the group. This person is the teacher and is quite often the scapegoat when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. How many times have you been accused of leaving out a rule when you know that a player simply forgot it or wasn't listening? Or, after explaining a very complex game and seeing the player's eyes glaze over, 
you might decide to leave some of the finer details out until a better time arises to explain them. You then get flack from the players for hiding important information. It seems that you just can't win when you are the rules person. It should be the group's responsibility to understand the game, not just one person. Mm -hmm. Maybe players can take turns explaining the game so that everyone can see just how hard it is. Maybe the game can be split up into pieces where each person learns and explains a certain part of the game. What are your thoughts on this? And one last question. Why is there just one set of rules in a game which has multiple players? All right, first off, thank you for the question, Roger, Roger Dodger. Um, these are the kind of questions I love getting. I like these nice, detailed, long questions with like background info, right? It starts off with some background and sets up a situation that Roger has run into, uh, run into and caused a problem for him, right? He has his own game night problem. He kind of goes on to explain what it is. He then gives more detail and he includes some insight and then finishes it off with some de definite questions for us to answer. These are the kind of questions I actually expected to get when we first started the show. And I was like, we're going to be a Dear Abby from Gamers. I actually thought we'd get more of the, hey, Mo and Sean, the other day I was running my game night and this happened, which I'm not really complaining that that's not what we got, but I do like it when we do get this. And don't forget, if you've got questions like this, mo at tabletopbellhop.com mm -hmm. or go right to the website and hit Ask the Bellhop. So there's quite a lot to unpack in Roger's question here, but overall, the gist of his question is basically that it can be not fun. It can be terrible to be the rule teacher. And there's a lot of pressure put on the rule teacher. And should it be there or should it not? It basically, Roger's kind of like, you're, you're, you're giving me the weight of the world here. I'm, I'm in charge of way too much stuff. I have way too much responsibility. And why can't we share this wealth? Why is it always down to one person to do this? The thing is, sometimes, yeah, it's a lot of work, but it can also be very rewarding. So there is, it's just like being a dungeon master in a role-playing game. Yes, you have more responsibilities. Yes, you have more work. Yes, you have to prepare the adventure and there's more going on in the background. But then when it all comes together and it works, I don't think there's anything more rewarding when playing a role-playing game than being a GM of a successful campaign. doesn't matter how much you pull off as a player, you're not going to get that feel as a successful DM does. Well, I get the exact same thing when teaching a game to someone when they, I see it click. And then again, when they finish the game, like, oh, that was a lot of fun. Or even more so, they decide to go get it. Like, oh, that's awesome. I now have to go get this game or I have to share this with my friends. Or if I'm teaching it at a store, having someone get up, go over and buy a copy of the game. That is such a fantastic feeling that yes, while there is some burden to teaching, I do personally at least think the rewards are worth it. Now it's going to be up to you to make that call if it is or isn't. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. There's a whole lot of, of sort of, push and take and a lot of it is going to depend on your personality yeah. and who you are whether or not you want to a deal with the teaching but also deal with the rewards that can come from yeah. teaching so let's break down roger's question into specific topics because he's got a lot of stuff in there so overall he's like teaching stinks it's not worth it or, or or sometimes i feel it's unfair so let's start off with the first thing he said, just his background info on using QR codes and his specific comment of, wouldn't it be great if it always happened this way? And well, yeah, I wish. Like if, if every time you sat down and played a game, it just went smoothly and it just worked and you all played and no one got upset at anyone for missing rules or everything, that'd be great. That's the ideal. So I don't think needing QR codes is necessarily the way to do it, but if it worked for you, all the power to you. And I do um, greatly respect the use of modern technology for that. Years ago, I couldn't point people to a Rado runs through or a Rodney Smith watch it played. The fact those even now exist is fantastic. And even having a QR code to a PDF on a Google Drive is something we couldn't have done years ago. I would have had to photocopy copies of the rules and bring them out to everyone. And I got to say, like, yes, it is awesome when it worked that works out and happens that way for the first time. And this is an interesting one because personally, I would much rather have the rule book in my hands mm -hmm. than a video or a PDF for a first learner of the rules. But then I'm also, I'm aware that I'm an old guy and I yeah. get 
that my preferences may not be the main anymore. And this is something we covered, I think, way back on like episode two of our podcast, where we talked about how players learn games. And everyone learns differently, and there are different ways you learn games. And I'll reiterate some of this. We'll throw a link to the actual podcast. I probably should have looked up which one it was. One of our early ones. We sound terrible, but the advice is good. <laughs> Plus, uh, there's an article on the blog. You can read it. That reads probably better than we sound. But what we're looking at is people learn by reading, sitting and reading the rules, by watching, watching someone do the rules, by listening, which is hearing someone read the rules out to you. And honestly, that is the smallest percentage of people. There are very few people that learn well, having the rules read to them. And most importantly is doing. The best way to actually learn a game and to teach a game is to get the players to play the game, whether that's a matter of just starting the game as quick as possible or the matter of getting them to touch and do the things while you're explaining it. So just little simple things like if they say it's a worker placement game, if you place your cube here, you can do this. We'll have the player put their cube there and then do whatever that is, right? So that is really important. And I think that's way more important than necessary. Like being able to provide multiple ways for people to learn is the important part. So the QR code could be great with the right group of players. Watching a watch it play group could be great with the right group of players. Giving everyone a PDF of the rules before the game is going to be great for players like Sean. Yeah, and it's interesting. And one of the problems you run into is uh, sort of the complexity of the game because Rotto might take, you know, 20 to 25 minutes to explain most games. Mm -hmm. Whereas some games you might take a half hour to explain to a group or you might take 15 or 10 minutes to explain to yeah. a group. Uh, and so the even if they learn better with uh, the video you may be taking a whole lot more time to deal with that video yes yeah and some of the videos are not quick if you, if you can't stand watching things at two times speed you're looking at like a half hour commitment or more yeah. if for most watch it played videos or how to play videos and even then they don't tend to teach everything uh rodney's most famous term i'll leave that for you to discover on your own can be an issue if everyone's expecting to learn to play right from that video Really, a lot of this should be done ahead of time, which that is something we are not going to get into this episode because we have covered on the past is how to teach games well. We're not going to get into that here, but one of my main suggestions is this is work that should be done ahead of time. Absolutely. Now, the thing is, as Roger points out, in general, just for whatever reason, because it's always been this way, the responsibility of deciphering and explaining the rules falls on one person in the group. Now, for some reason, and it kind of makes sense to me in a way, this defaults to the person who owns the game. And to me, that makes sense because you are the person who owns it. So you have the rules and you're probably the one that's asking everyone else to come play. So you're the one trying to organize things and get things going. And the onus is on you to now provide a good experience with that game. So it's on you to teach it. Now, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. This is in general how things are now. And this person who is the teacher is quite often the scapegoat when things go wrong. Now, I don't know. I like it just, it's always been that way. I, I can't think of a good justification for it, except for the fact that like, well, it's your game. I, the same thing goes with DMs again. I, I guess I'm going to talk a lot about role-playing games tonight, but the, the teacher of the game and the GM in a role-playing game have very similar roles, responsibilities. And it's been for years, the DM's responsibility to schedule the game to get the players together, to provide the snacks, to provide the players, to track the treasure, to track the NPCs, to write the adventure. And there's no reason it has to be that way, except that some early GMs were power freaks and control freaks that wanted to do all that. And now the game has finally evolved to a point where people are realizing like, hey, you know what? It's your character. You read all the rules for that. I don't need to know every rule in the game. I just kind of need to know how to run the monsters. And you know what? Yeah, I'm going to run the game, but you guys are going to have the fun. So how about you figure out the schedule and I'll just show up because I don't need that added stress. And like, that's becoming more of a thing. And I would love to see that more on the board gaming side as well. In general, people show up to play games and people show up to show off games and they tend to be two different groups of people. And well, if you want to show off the game, you generally have to be the one to teach it. And I very much know the feeling of, well, it's your game. Like teach us, I'm here, entertain me. Here yeah. I am now, entertain us. Yeah, and so if it naturally falls to the person who's best at it to teach, yes. great. But it often, as we've just finished saying, falls to whoever owns the game. 
And that person may not be the best person to teach the game. Uh, and the same for GMing, you know, again, oh, you bought the books? Great, run us an adventure. Um, now, interestingly, uh, while generally Mo is the teacher for various reasons, not the least of which because he owns all the games, uh, <laughs> but uh, not too long ago, I'm the one who taught us Draconis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was simply because Mo was up sharing sales and I went downstairs to the game room and opened up the box and sorted all the cards and read through the rules. So I was prepared to teach it and we had the time with the game to be able to prep mm -hmm. to teach it. Uh, whereas, again, normally, if you are the owner of the game, you're the person who has that time with the product yes. to teach. And that's one of the big things is teaching a game by just reading the uh, by just reading the PDF or just watching the video is problematic. Having the actual physical game in front of you. And again, me, this might just be me, but for me, it makes a huge difference as to whether or not mm -hmm. I can prop learn it well enough to teach it or maybe just learn it well enough to struggle through on BGA until I've played it a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. BGA, we said it before, not a good way to learn a game nope. or teach. It's terrible. Same with Tabletopia. I assume, um, and Tabletop Simulator. You don't really want to teach games there. It can be done, yep. but it's rough. Now, the thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. Now, in all the years of playing game, I've only seen this relationship once where a person with the budget buys games What's the shipping address of the rule teacher in the, the checkout order online? They tend to buy from Cool Stuff Inc. because uh, they have credit from selling a ton of magic cards there. Uh, and then the game shows up at the game teacher's house who then does all the unboxing and reading the rules. And then the person who bought the game shows up on Saturday and is like, show me my new game. <laughs> and it works fantastic. That group has a dynamic that that works so well and so awesome. That, that I almost envy it, except I'm, I don't mind teaching games. Like if I hated teaching games, it would be awesome. Uh, but it would be so awesome now and then to just like hear someone, I, I admit, this is one of the things I miss about public play is not having to teach, being able to show up and have someone else present to me the, like I get to sit back and go, come on, entertain me. Show me, show me the fun, show me the fun, come on. And I do miss it. And so there's no reason it has to be that way, but there are reasons that it has developed that way. For one, too, is the person buying the game is usually the one excited about the game that wants to play it. And the players are usually like, sure, show me a new game. Like yeah. like most of my friends are that way. Like my friends aren't like the people we game with aren't like, oh, show me Star Trek. That looks awesome. They're just like, all right, what do you have to show us tonight? We're willing to play anything. So it's more about me showing off the game. So, of course, it's my job to do the work to present the game or find someone who can. Absolutely. And again, it so much depends on that dynamic both as a person but also as a group uh there are times mm. when yeah i would love to get down and if you know if mo's up there sharing sales i will absolutely crack open the box pull out the rule book start pushing you know pushing some uh, components around so that i can learn it myself mm. and then mo doesn't have no one has to teach because mo knows the game already or maybe mo has to refresh it or i can help yeah. mo refresh his understanding of the game and then we just jump in and play uh, which can be a great way to do it. But again, that's a time investment mm -hmm. that has to be made. Now, we also did talk about this as much more recently, getting games to the table right away. So you bought the game, put it to the table. How do you learn it quickly? That's where we get into some of the stuff Roger talked about with different people sharing the responsibility. And we didn't get into some ideas for that, but I was thinking about it. And I think another thing with Roger is Roger is new to hobby board gaming. He's new to these more complex where you actually do need to prep ahead of time and prepare and learn to teach. Unlike you sit down and you teach the basic moves and you go like in most abstract games, right? You just sit down and kind of play and figure it out because there aren't that many options. Well, the thing is, all of Roger's gaming experience is basically public play. And again, public play, you have two groups. You have people who are excited about a game that want to show it off, and you have people who are just there to play games. And you're always going to end up with that imbalance. If you are the person who wants to try and show new games, you, again, either have to bite the bullet and teach the games yourself or find someone else who can. But the biggest thing is getting over that hurdle of thinking, it's my game. It's mine. I bought it. It's mine. You have to let it go. You have to find someone. If you know someone who's teaching it, it's like, again, like, um, I don't see if there's any reason not to mention them. If Clayton wants to play a game, he gets it shipped to Jamie's house. 
like it works for them and and it's a it's a really neat relationship and i think it's kind of awesome like board game polyamory going on there and i mean like it makes sense and and, and clayton's entire game collection is at jamie's house because they play at jamie's house because he's got a nice game table and a place to play but technically clayton bought the games but clayton doesn't have that it's mine. I need to hold it. I need to hoard it. I need to see my precious thing. He was willing to let that go. And if you're willing to do that, your best bet is if you don't enjoy teaching is to find someone else who does. Absolutely. And no, I'm not saying Roger, you should ship all your games to me. That wasn't me trying to get, <laughs> get some new games out of them. <laughs> so next Roger asks, how many times have been accused, you been accused of leaving out a rule when you know that players simply forgot and wasn't listening? Now, I will say, not often. This hasn't come up that much, but it used to come up more often. And I think it's because I've just gotten better at teaching. Like, I've developed skills at teaching games so that this doesn't come up. For one, making sure I know which rules are important, repeating them multiple times, like, remember this, remember this, especially something that's often forgotten, literally sitting there and going, okay, here's some rules you're going to forget. Reminding people once you're playing of those important rules you're going to forget. Remember how I said at the beginning in turn four, the economy is going to shift from boats to rivers? Well, it's about to be turn four, so just remember to be aware of that. Um, make sure you're engaging with the players. Uh, again, the biggest trick for engaging someone while, take, while teaching a game is getting them to touch things. Have them draw cards from their decks. Have them put their meeples on the board. Have them roll the dice. Just do keep them engaged. You should have a check for understanding. Like, if someone looks like they're kind of zoned out, question them. Like, say, did you get that? You're going to trade cards? Show me how it works, right? It's it's teaching skills, which I've developed over years. I have been teaching people to play games since the 1980s. I have lots of experience teaching people to play games and people of different skill levels. Now, if someone is completely checking out, confirm they don't want to play. Like, maybe they showed up to game night at the local game store and it ends up that they had a bad day and they thought they were going to get into it. And they're just not. Um, see if you actually want to play. And don't be mean about it. Like, do you not want to play? You're not paying attention. More of a, hey, is this not your thing? If this doesn't sound cool to you, you're give, give them a note. Open door policy, right? Like, hey, if you're not interested in playing this, that's fine. We'll find someone else to play or we'll play without you. Like, And, and make it guilt-free right? Not, you're going to ruin this game. We're not going to be able to play, but hey, take a step away if this doesn't sound interesting to you. And many times, just people have other things in the mind. They get distracted. The other thing you may be able to do in this case is present another way to learn. So if it looks like, like you're reading the rules and there's no doubt, say, hey, do you want to read it? How about you read this section out loud? Or how about you read this, this section? Or can you summarize this? Or even have another player do it so there's a change in voice. Or again, say, you're obviously not getting this. How about I bring up a watch a play? and have everyone watch it on their phones because someone at the table is going to have a phone in 2021. I hope someone at your game table has a phone or grab a laptop or go, everyone go downstairs to the PlayStation and we'll boot it up YouTube on there. Yeah. And this is also something uh, where you're going to play extreme. Uh, and this is one yeah. thing that I don't mind doing. And this is, this is something that, that, you know, there are times when I know for, personally for me, that I will probably forget something. And it's not because mm -hmm. I, Mo hasn't taught it to me. It's simply because there are, you know, in certain games, there's a lot of stuff going oh, yeah. on. There's a lot of stuff to take in and I'm going to forget something. And you know what? Oh, well, I'm probably going to remember it better next time, having mm -hmm. been reminded of it when I show up that I have forgotten it during that game. And so I don't win the first game. That's fine. I'm probably not yeah. going to win the next six games either. I don't mm -hmm. care. I'm there to have fun. If you teach every single rule for a game that we're about to sit down and play, odds are you'll be, asleep, you know, we'll be asleep before it's done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, things will get left out. And when they come up and play, you can handle it then. Uh, unless you're playing with those hyper competitive players who have to know every single rule to, in order to work out the best strategy before. Yes. Those yes. are the ones you hand the rule book. Yep. Here. There, there you go. go. <laughs> here you go if you're concerned i missed something feel free to look it up yourself and honestly those players give them the rule book like like when you're all set and you're done teaching say here you might want to reference this while we're playing and give it to them and trust me they will they'll be looking up every little play that players do because they're someone who obviously learns better by reading um so the other thing here is something we've mentioned multiple times on the show 
uh, setting expectations, right? You need to make sure everyone knows the first time you are teaching a game, it's not going to be a perfect experience. Someone at the table is going to forget something. Someone's going to try to break the rules and try to do something that's not allowed. Don't get frustrated. Don't get upset. And then there's always the option we always mention that I know very few people take account on. Once you know everyone's got the game, you can always stop and restart at the beginning with everyone with all that knowledge. Absolutely. Test games, play, teaching games. It's okay yes. to not finish a game. Now, getting back to Rogers. After explaining a very complex game, seeing the player's eyes glaze over, you might decide to leave out some of the finer details until a better time to explain it. You then get flack from the players for hiding information. So, again, you want to get buy-in. Do you want to play this game? Are you sure you're going to play this game? Are, are you invested in this? Like, I noticed you're kind of phasing out. Did you catch the last thing I just said? That check for understanding. Again, keep people engaged. Try not to leave things out. Um, like, you know, especially if it's something that is, like, important to the game where someone's going to be like, well, you didn't tell me those four. Uh, that's the skill, right? Make sure you mention them in passing. Um, when they do call you out for not teaching it, you look to one of the other players and kind of, I taught that, right? Like, just get a, so the table knows. So it's not just you and them, oh, I taught that, you're not. You're just like, I did mention that, right? I apologize. You want to take back your last turn? Because again, teaching game, remember, be very clear that it's a teaching game. Everyone sitting down to play a game for the first time should realize it's about learning to play the game, not who's going to win. Even if you're highly competitive, that first play should be to explore and find out what happens. Now, if you do have to leave things out, especially in some games where things don't unlock until later in the game, don't even become viable options until turn three, make sure you let everyone know. I am not going to explain this now because it doesn't matter till turn three. I am not going to explain this now because we're in the story part of the game and it won't matter till we get to the adventure part of the game or so on. And then make sure you do remember to mention the stuff when it does happen. Like, we're finishing up turn two. Remember, in turn three, we're going to get to this new phase of the game, and here's what's going to happen. Here's how things change. Then, one of the most important rules that is very difficult for some people to learn, if a player is a jerk, remind them they have no obligation. You have no obligation to teach them the game or keep playing games with them. Yeah, this so much this. As we have often said about relationships, if you're not enjoying a game night with your group, change things. Fix the problem. There's no obligation to keep people around if they are causing problems. Mm -hmm. So back to Roger's question. Seems you just can't win when you're the rule person. Should be the group's responsibility to understand the game, not just one person. Well, again, I disagree about you can't win. If you're the rules person, you teach the game well and people enjoy it, you just won. And that feeling is fantastic and so worth it, to me at least, because I enjoy teaching games. As for being the, the, the group's responsibility, Yes, it very much is. Maybe this is all about setting expectations because it is everyone's responsibility to understand the game. Everyone at the table should be working together to make the game as much fun as possible. This will involve things like helping other players out, reminding other players of rule mistakes, asking questions when you're not sure on something. It's not the rule teacher's responsibility to keep the game fun once you start playing. It's their job to get the rules across. Everyone then has to work together to understand the game. This could involve looking up stuff in rules. This could involve, as it many times does nowadays, grabbing your phone and going on Board Game Geek to look up a rule question that's not covered in the book. That doesn't have to be one person that does that. It should be a shared thing. And I will say that, yes, it would be awesome if more people shared the teaching responsibility. And a great way to do that goes back to our topic of, excuse me, our topic of picking which, which games to play is that every week a different person should present a game. Well, maybe you rotate who's going to teach it. And again, if you have a group of six and two people are game teachers, maybe the people bring the games the one week and leave it with the other players for a week so that they can teach it the week after. But all of this is about setting expectations. If you're playing at a public play, that's different. If you're going to show up to a public play event and you're showing up to play, show up to play. But if you're showing up expecting to play a specific game, show up with the game expecting to teach it, and it's a bonus if someone else there can teach it for you. But if you're playing with your own home group, it's all about sitting down going, all right, who's going to teach the games? No one. We all hate teaching games. All right, so here's the rule. You do not show up to the game night without knowing how to play the game. 
however you figure that out download the rule book get the pdf watch rodney smith watch uh, paul grogan sit down on board game geek watch an actual play go on twitch and watch the live stream whatever it takes you show up here ready to play and i gotta admit that sounds like an awesome game night to me but i don't usually plan that far ahead yeah and part of the issue is time and planning if i go down to mo's house to play a game i may not know what game that will be you know as we talk about mm -hmm. there is a list of games that need to be played yes. and we don't do them in order uh and when if and when i get there if we have say four hours to play a game and we want to play Anachrony. Mm -hmm. Taking an hour to teach myself that game, which Mo might already know and be able to speed through the teach of, before we can play, one, that isn't fun for Mo, because he may already know the game, and it means we might not even get the game in, yeah. because, you know, we're, you know, everyone is spinning around, spending the time learning the game instead of working together as a group to learn mm -hmm. it and play it. So next, Roger has some ideas on how to improve things. And I got to agree. I, I agree with most of this. So, so maybe players can take turns explaining the game so everyone can see just how hard it is. I, I don't know. I, saying, saying you need to walk in my shoes to me is, is a bit much. It's not, it, different people show up to play games and to game night expecting different things. And you're always going to have those people that are just there to socialize and have fun and don't even care what they're playing. And you're going to have the people who are there that are like, please entertain me. I need a break. I want to play a game. And I'm not, like, it sounds selfish. And I guess in a way it is, but you know what? They probably have lots of responsibilities in the real life they have to deal with. Like, I'm not trying to judge people here by saying it that way, but I think it's perfectly valid to show up the game night saying entertain me. Like, please, you teach me the game. I'm not here to do homework. I'm here to have fun. And learning games and teaching games can be homework. So, what I would try to do is see if there are other game teachers. So as we talked about, find out who the game teachers are and find a way to get the games in their hands ahead of time so that they can be ready for it. Now, we also talked about splitting the game into pieces where each player learns and explains a certain part of the game. I personally think that's best for that. I just opened up the game. The four of us are sitting down. I bought it off the store shelf and we're trying to learn it here. Maybe that is where it gets to something we're going to mention in a second time about multiple rule books because that's one of the problems. So I can kind of see it. But like if you're prepping to show up Saturday night and it's Thursday and you're like, all right, we're all going to take a different section of an act. I just can't see it working. I Maybe it depends on the game. With role-playing games, sure. That's where I would literally say, and this is a rule I have in my role-playing game groups from D&D &D 4E on, is it's your character. You better know how it works. That is not my responsibility to know your powers, your abilities, your armor, how your companions work, how your powers work. That's all on you. I got enough to take care of. And I'm going to trust you to not cheat. And then maybe if it's one of those games you're not sure, you might want to audit. But again, you're just checking because players probably made mistakes because it's easy to make mistakes. But that's the way I am. So I could totally see you splitting up there, right? If I'm about to run D&D, &D, it's here's your piece is your character and your piece is your character and my piece is this character. And if you happen to have an animal companion, you better know the animal companion rules. And if you happen to have a familiar, you better have the familiar rules down because I don't care. I want to focus on the story and the bad guys and the stuff that is under my control. For a board game though, like, like oh, you figure out the trading rules for Catan and I'm going to figure out the resource generation. Like most games work only as a whole. They don't have those individual pieces. So I, I just can't see how to split it up. But I do recommend, again, everyone take their time to figure out the game on their own, right? Like, like try to do the due diligence ahead of time. Um, sit there and watch the watch a play, get the PDFs and so on. Yeah, I think one of the big things is play raids. Uh, yeah. You cannot go wrong mm -hmm. with player raids because because a good player raid, whether that's something that comes with a game, and we're seeing a lot of them now, a lot yeah. of cards coming with games having player raids, or something you've downloaded from one of the various sites online, uh, that a good player raid can turn a teach into an overview. Yes. Hey, here are the steps of the game. For details on those steps, Look at your player gu mm -hmm. uh, guide. Look at that card next to you. Oh, you forget. I'm going to quickly run through what all the turn the turn sequence is. If you forget, check the card next to you. It yeah. makes such a big deal and really da offloads a lot of the cognitive load onto the mm -hmm. players and their uh, yes. aids. And one thing to watch, I give them out first. I've seen people teach a game and then be like, oh, and here are some player aids. No, no, give them to the players. 
because they're going to start reading them while you're talking. And then make sure your teach is in the same order as the cards, if you can. Like, like present things in the same order, which again, I'm, I'm talking a little bit higher level skills here. I, I don't know, higher levels, but like just from experience. And if someone is just reading, reading in your cards, give them a chance to read them. So don't be like, here are all the player aids. Okay, on turn one, you do this. Like, here are all the player aids. Take a minute to look those over. Give people a chance to look them over. And while they're doing it, set up the board or something. Or again, I've talked about this before, set up situations so that you can teach the hard parts of the game. Put stuff out, stack decks, make it so, like watch a Rodney Smith how to play. He's not getting lucky when he flips those cards <laughs> over the deck that match what he's saying, right? You can set that up ahead of time if you've got the time for it. But again, that's all about teaching better, which is not really his question. So the final question he does ask is why is there one set of rules in a game with multiple players? And it's because of that traditional reason that one player generally teaches the game. Now, is it good or bad? I will admit, I don't want to pay more for a game if that's what it takes to put more rule books in there. Because it's a one-time thing. You're only sitting down with one group. You're generally only sitting down once to read the rules. And having four copies of the rules is unnecessary once you've learned the game. You only need one copy to reference once you start playing. It's just like, again, Dungeons & Dragons example. I want four players' handbooks for my four players, probably. I only need one Dungeon Master's Guide. So I can kind of see that. But I have run tons and tons of D&D games with one player's handbook that gets passed around between all the players. You don't... Rule books, honestly, aren't designed to teach games. Good rule books aren't designed to teach games. They're actually designed to be good reference once you start playing. And because of that, you don't need multiple reference manuals. Just like in real life, if, you're, if you've got a computer system, somewhere on the shelf is a reference manual you can grab with the specifics for your robot or your machine or whatever. You don't need a copy for every operator, even if multiple people are operating it at once. So I totally, I, I personally don't complain about there being more than one copy of the rules, but there better be multiple copies of the damn rule summaries and reference cards, because that one drives me nuts. I am perfectly fine with one rule book. One player learns and I'm cool with that or multiple people learn from other sources. But if you're going to put in a reference card that has the turn order or the phases or how to do combat or the exploration flow chart, give me a copy for everyone, please. Or at least, at the very least, one for every two players. Oh, just give me one I, for I every I would prefer player. what It depends <laughs> on the size. Like, if it's a technology tree, you probably only need one for every two. But yeah. if, it's the, if it's the actual rules or step, you know, uh, or step steps to the game then yes absolutely you need one per player i find technology charts you can usually pass it around pretty easily yeah it's true reference charts um the other thing too um as the chat room's already mentioned but i was going to get to it is nowadays you can find the rules like i don't remember the last time i couldn't find like even old games where you couldn't find a pdf copy of the rule book somewhere on board game geek and 99 percent of the publishers now give them out for free you can find them right on the publisher website. And if not, like I said, go to Board Game Geek. There's also a really good chance you'll find a translated rule book in your language of choice. But here's another little added bonus. We're all Anglophones here. But if you don't speak, if English is not your first language, go find a translation of the rule book. Read that instead of the English one. And then when you teach it, you can teach it in whatever language your group prefers. Now, um, I'm trying to think of someone I know actually goes and gets the French version of rule books. And then teaches in English, but just they can understand the French way better than the English version. So that's also something you'll find on Board Game Geek. Um, overall, I don't know, it, it, it can stink, but someone's got to do it. Like, like that's kind of the thing. Someone's going to have to learn to teach the game. Yes, the default is the person who owns the game. The person who brings the game to name night is default the person that's going to have to teach it. But there's no actual reason it has to be. Now, yes, at a public play event where you are showing up to show off this awesome new game you've got, you're probably going to be the one who's going to teach it. But with your own gaming group, this is something that can be worked out ahead of time. As we've mentioned a million times in the show, almost every game night problem we discuss can be fixed with setting expectations. And that's what should be done in this case. Sit down with your group and say, you know what, I don't really enjoy teaching games. Heck, even setting the expectation of, you know what, I don't really enjoy teaching games, and what I hate the most is when you're not paying attention, and then you blame me for getting it wrong. I'm doing my best. I'm not the best teacher. You should all realize that. We're all here to have fun. Please be nice to me if I make a mistake, right? Like, like, like be kind. Realize we're all here to have fun, right? That's also setting expectations. And no, I wouldn't be like, well, here you try to teach it. You want to try to avoid those kind of conflicts. I don't think 
forcing teaching on someone is a good thing. Um, forcing teachers, if they wanted to teach games, they go buy their own games and show up with them. There's probably a reason they're not doing that. So yeah, it can stink. Someone's got to do it. Try to find that someone and make sure the expectations set ahead of time. It's funny. We we're talking about uh, multiple copies of rule books. I still remember, and I think I still have several games from uh, my family's collection where the rules are on the top of the box. Yes. There is no rule books. The, the yeah. only way to read the rules is, when, is by opening up the box and reading the lid. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely the the, uh, the 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 how rule books were presented. There, there weren't yeah. rule books. The instructions that was, that was of the, the game very... were on. That was the chieftain game, Parker Brothers way. Yeah, yeah, by Parker Brothers throughout the seventies. That was your rules were yeah. probably on the box because they didn't want to print out another, you know, another piece of paper to include and get I, lost. It just it's such a standard thing. Like even sports, how many baseball players have sat down and read the rules of baseball? <laughs> right there was a teacher the coach that taught them how to play it, it's yeah. just it's and some people make good coaches some people make bad coaches if you don't like being the coach you find someone else to do it like it's kind of the same thing the way we have yep well i think that's it for our talk about the burden placed on the game teaching in tabletop gaming groups Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or just emailing mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our detailed spoiler-free review of The Forest of No Return. Thanks, Ulysses Spiel, for sending us a copy of this expansion to check out. The Adventuria Adventure card game was designed by Michael Palm and Lucas Zack. Now, the adventures in this expansion for Adventuria were written by Christian Lonsing, Michael Mingers, and Marcus Plotz. While I would love to credit all the artists that work on this project, there are 22 of them, and that would take far too long, but I do appreciate the work that went into it. Now, the English version of this expansion was published by Ulysses Spiel back in 2016. Now, this was the first expansion for the Adventure Adventure card game, which is required for you to use the contents of this box. This is not a standalone expansion. It has an MSRP of $29.99 US and is designed to be played by one to five players. For more information on the Aventuria base set, as well as the various other expansions we've seen so far, check out our reviews on the blog, YouTube, and the podcast. So the Forest of No Return contains a new character. Hilbert from Awen, a blessed one of Parain, a druid-like hero, as well as three adventures. Now, two of these are short one-act adventures, and the last is a longer three-act adventure. Each of these adventures is a standalone experience, but of course, you're welcome to use the same group of heroes for each of them. As usual, there are four difficulties presented for each story, adding to the replayability of this box set. Well, for a look at the components you get in this box, making sure not to spoil the story at all, check out our Forest of No Return unboxing video on YouTube. So in this box, you'll find a hero deck, a hero counter, a life wheel, and a liturgical chant counter for Hilbert. That's the new character. You also get a number of tokens, including one new fate point, grabbed counters, body control counters, and additional doom time counters. Cards for each of the three adventures, 22 new henchman cards, four new reward cards, and a selection of event and leader action cards. Now the card quality here matches everything else out for adventure and everything else we own which is good and what you want from a collectible or sorry not collectible from a a deck building card game but the tokens and life wheels are actually quite different they have a glossy coating that really sticks out when compared to the stuff i already own now additionally the life wheel is actually constructed differently from the ones you get in the wheel of life expansion this one's like snapped together and doesn't screw apart so once you put it together it's it's stuck forever that said, none of that matters. Like, none of this matters as far as gameplay is concerned. The gloss kind of sticks out on the table, but it doesn't impact your play. So it is notable, though, that of all the boxes that we've received and opened, there is a range of different and mismatched components. Mm -hmm. Again, not in any way that impacts the game. But it feels a bit thrown together when some characters have wheels, some characters have cards, some have tokens, and some don't, mm -hmm. as well as some having gender swap versions, while others don't. 
So all of this is due to the fact that there were two printings of the game, basically two editions of Aventuria. It came out originally, I don't know the exact year, and all of the heroes had wheels. And I don't know on the adventure counters at all. They were also all glossy components. So for tracking health, everyone had a wheel and it was snapped together. Well, when they decided to reprint the game, and as far as I know, this is also some, something tied with a Kickstarter to bring it to North America and localizing. Again, I don't have the full details on this, but when they went to remake the game, it ends up they could no longer get the plastic clips that they used to make the wheels. So instead, they decided to switch to a card based, which is like Euchre, where you have one card with numbers 1 to 10 on it, another card you turn that says 0 to 40. So that's the reason that one changed. But I have no idea why sometimes you get an adventure token and sometimes you don't. When those are actually, in a way, integral to play, because you're supposed to put them somewhere and randomize them and then figure out, uh, like I use a bag and I randomize my bag, pull them out to randomize characters. Now, the whole thing is you don't need that. When we're playing two player, we just roll a die. Even it's you, odd it's me. Way quicker, it's easier than fiddling around. But it's odd that you do get some and sometimes you don't. I do find that interesting. Now, all of the gender swapped versions is actually all from promo cards. That's not something that comes in any of the expansions. So there is a promo set with gender swap characters for this particular set, but there isn't like, it's not like the included adventures to come with gender swap versions. So that makes sense. And again, I'm not sure how they chose which characters to do gender swaps for and which they didn't. All right. Well, now that you know what you get in the box, how about you walk through how you can use all this to improve your Aventuria games? All right, starting with the hero, the new hero, Hilbert Owen, the Blessed One of Perrine. So Blessed Ones are the holy people in the Dark Eye set. They use what are something called liturgical chants instead of magic. They actually can't use magic. They use chants instead. Now, Hilbert is an experienced adventurer who realizes not everyone's as peaceful and calm as he is. He seeks to stand up for the weak and protect them from all danger. Now, he felt drawn to distant lands, sensing that people there were in greater need than the folk back in his home of Owen. One quote from him is, he who works a lot must also eat a lot, as his motto. Now, Brother Hilbert is what I would call a druid. He's not a D&D style priest, right? When you hear Blessed One of Perrine, and he's a priest, and he's a holy brother of, of the, the Perrine, I, I think like priest, D&D priest, but that is not what he is. He is much more druid. He includes a number of animal attacks, animal companions, spell casting things and liturgical chants, as well as cards that protect, heal, and buff. Many of his cards also affect the die rolls in play, both his and his opponents, and he features three attack types, which can turn him into quite the powerhouse later in a combat. Skill-wise, he's great at craft, good at persuade and survival, but not so great at the physical stuff like body control, perception, and stealth. Now, the liturgical chance is something brand new. It's a new type of card that features a new mechanic where you have to pay endurance for each card in play, each chant in play at the end of your turn, or else they go away. So you basically have to save up endurance for the end of your turn. Now, Hilbert's ability that you can use once per combat is to pick one chant in play and ignore that cost so it can just stay up permanently. So... Is it just me, but I'm getting a bit of a, almost a Friar Tuck vibe from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I can totally see that. Though I got to say it's Friar Truck if he was a druid and can turn into a tiger. Well, I'd say, you know what? Honestly, the, the, the Robin Hood Friar is way more druid than a okay. uh, D&D priest, I, generally speaking, I would say. Fair um, enough. Maybe not turning into tigers. But <laughs> The, the love of food and drink, definitely part of the character, is definitely, I, I would say, inspired in some ways. So that's the character. What about the adventures? So starting off the short adventures, you've got two short one-act adventures. First is called Head Money. It has your characters tracking down a murderer and stumbling into something much more sinister. Now, this is very much a horror adventure with some really strong depictions of gore, including mutilation and body horror. Now, the adventure features three tests and one combat, the difficulty of the combat, which is going to be modified by how well your group does on the tests. Which is, frankly, pretty standard fare for these adventures. Mm -hmm. I think overall now we know that some body horror is to be expected in Adventuria adventures now. 
Yeah, that's something we've noticed over time. The more adventures we play, the more the more we explore outside of the core box, you definitely do get a tone shift. But that's something I'll get into more when I'm sharing on my thoughts instead of just covering what comes in the box. So next up, we have Selmian Delusions. This is another short adventure. It follows the exact same format. Three tests and a combat. No, the tests are completely different. The combat's completely different, but it's got that same format. Now, in this short adventure, you're trying to rescue a princess who has run away from her father and gotten involved in something unsavory. The adventure is also quite dark and includes even more adult-oriented content, including an orgy involving men, animals, and non-humans. So all of this is just mentioned in passing. This isn't in as much romance novel-like detail that we found in the Veil vale Dancer expansion that we, appear, we reviewed last week. Aventuria is certainly proving to be a darker setting, more akin to Warhammer or other mm. similar games that don't offer up a lot in the way of hopeful positivity in the world. Now, finally, is the much longer Forest of No Return adventure from which this box set gets its name. This is a full three-act adventure that includes 37 adventure cards. In this adventure, you're hired by King Casimir himself, to recover a very valuable piece of parchment, his family tree, which is needed to prove his legitimacy and prevent civil war. Each act in the story follows the same format as the short adventures. You've got three checks followed by a combat, all linked together by the story. While this adventure is designed to be played in order one act at a time, you can also choose to play any one of the three acts as a standalone short adventure. Now, what's interesting here Tone-wise, is this adventure is not nearly as dark as the other two. This better matches the tone of the adventures in the core box. This is one I would have no problem playing with my kids. And I actually figured this may be something due to the fact that I've learned that the Adventuria stories are actually classic adventure modules that are being brought back to life. Classic, the Dark Eye RPG adventure modules being brought back to life. And I have, I, I, I may be completely off track here, but I have a feeling... The Forest of No Return was like a classic 70s, 80s, old school module where the two short stories were written much more modern. Certainly makes sense. So this is probably the most content you've gotten adventure-wise from any box since the base set, yes? Yeah, definitely. Um, though it is a bit odd because we're going out of order, right? So technically, this was the first expansion ever published for Adventuria. It's not the first I played. We opened some hero sets and we tried some other stuff first. It has just as many adventures as the core box, two short, one long, but these are all more involved and deeper than the core box. So the short adventures of the core box have one check in a combat, and there's not much story there. They're one page, boom, make a check, boom, have a combat. Whereas there is a lot more checks and things that are affected before each combat in this. So I would say for co-op adventures, you are getting more content than the base game in this box. All right, well, they're certainly giving you your money's worth. So as long as the type of content isn't of concern. Yeah, so in these two adventures, the main Forest of No Return and Sell Me in Delusions, they do introduce a new mechanic to Adventuria that I got to say is welcome. Uh, this is the environment cards. There are four of these in the set, and they're specific to the included adventures. So it's not like the henchmen or the events where you're going to shuffle them in with the rest of your cards. These only work for these adventures. Now, each of these is placed in play at the start of the combat and add additional rules into play. And I don't want to spoil what they do, but they are definitely interesting. Now, the main game rules contains a way to play through a random combat, like a, like a wandering monster fight. And I would be very tempted to grab these, shuffle them up and throw one into play to make that more interesting. Because I can't see mixing them these into a different adventure. I can't see doing like the um, the T Master Taylor's Poltergeist and throwing one of these into play. It just wouldn't work. But I would love to see these used in more things. And I'm wondering if future content may call back these, though they are specifically labeled for each individual story. Indeed. While not exactly missed, the location of the fight was, until now, never anything other than some color text in the yes. lead-up documentation. And despite being called environments, it's not always just about the place, is all I will say. Now, I mentioned above, but it's also worth noting that each of these adventures provides four different time cards and can be played at four different le difficulty levels from easy to legendary. This, combined with the fact you can play each of the big adventures separately at different difficulty levels, adds quite a bit of replayability to these cooperative adventures. 
So as we mentioned, with all the Venturia content, there is no which way. You are going to get the same linear story every time. There's certainly no shortage of replayability with the same or different groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now that we know what you get and how you use it, what are your thoughts on this, the first Aventuria expansion? So let's start with the biggest shock to us when sitting down to play through these new adventures, and that is the tone of the stories. This is a tone we didn't really see in the core set. The short adventures in Forest of No Return are very much grim, dark fantasy, bordering on horror. These stories are gruesome and dark and involve what I would call R-rated content. There's gore, body horror, eroticism, bestiality, and more. And as I mentioned before, this was perhaps hinted that the game could go this way Maybe. in the base set. But I think if you got the base set and played it with your family, you might be shocked if you yeah. wanted to keep playing it with your family, moving on to these new adventures. So again, I did mention it earlier, the three-act story, I think you'd have no problem with. Uh, there is someone who has been tortured, and it just says the tortured person gives you this information, as opposed to more like the other adventures where it would describe the state of the tortured person. Here it's all glossed over in like any fantasy story. If you've read a fantasy novel, Dragonlance, like I would put this at the, the high fantasy feel versus the grim dark. But the short adventures are definitely something else. Now, what I do want to say is I don't think this is a bad thing. Not at all. I have no problem with grim dark. I am a huge fan of Warhammer. I've been for years, but I think anyone considering picking up this box set should be aware of this darker tone in the two stories. Because this was a surprise to us. Because the stories in the adventure core set were almost whimsical like especially the master taylor's poltergeist was pure whimsy then another one where you're guessing a goblin's name yes the big adventure did have vampires and got a little darker and there was some demon summoning but it was never described in detail well there was some violence in the full adventure it was nothing compared to what we saw in the short adventures in forest of no return now now that we played this and some other adventure adventures i now know what to expect so again, it's something we mentioned many times on the show. Setting expectations is some of the most important things you can do at game night. Knowing what you're getting into is important here. Now that I know what to get into, I now know that Deanne and I need to pre-play any stories before we decide to share them with the kids. Now, forgetting about this tone change, I got to say straight up, I really enjoyed this adventure expansion for Adventuria. Well, it is a bit strange that the component quality doesn't match up on some of the bits. Again, that doesn't matter. For play at all so to me that's a, that's a no problem i personally appreciate having a wheel to track held over cards though oddly if you get the wheel of life expansion which we've already reviewed and looked at you'll now have two wheels for hilbert one that's glossy one that's not the one in wheel of life is also flippable though to the gender swapped version which is gertrude sword Plower, blessed one appearing now the cards for that female presenting version actually has a totally different set of skills, which is interesting, but you'll have to find that in the Ship of Stone promo pack, not in this box set. Again, the components you use as a player, not the cards, all the accessories are a bit of a frustration, even though they have actually little impact or no impact on the actual game yeah. play. Now, looking at Hilbert, the new character, I have played him through one of the short adventures, as well as the three-act adventure, which took us more than three tries. And I really enjoyed playing. Yet again, we have another hero that manages to feel and play very differently from every other hero we play. I love that about this game so far. Now, I found Hilbert to be very fragile. Um, he only has one armor card in his entire deck and lots of cards for debuffing his opponents and improving his meager attack stats. He starts off with some low stats. You're looking at less than 50% chance to hit with most of your attacks. Well, his liturgical chants are powerful, the fact you basically have to burn one endurance every turn can make them very costly, especially in combats where you need to make tests as well as attacks. So if you're in a combat where you have to spend two endurance to make a test, what's more important having that spell up or making that test to be able to affect the lieutenant? Now, once you do get some cards into play, though, Hilbert can be powerful. He features all three attack types, melee, ranged, and magic, doing more than D6 damage for all of them, including one whopping liturgical chant, Animal Shape, that features an attack that gives you plus two to hit and does 2D6 plus two damage, only at the cost of five to put into play. Hmm. 
Now, all of this, though, relies on keeping him alive until he can get that card into play, which is not easy with a low dodge of five and very few defense cards. In the first chapter of Forest No Return, I got down to four hit points by turn five. Now, overall, I think I still prefer Arbosh, the Dwarf's Blacksmith. I don't know what my attraction is to, attraction is to that character, maybe because he was the first I played. I did enjoy playing Hilbert and would happily play him again. And even if it's not to your taste, the fact that they found yet another mechanic and style of play to incorporate as an mm -hmm. option is just great. You just might want to have a healer on hand. Yes. Now, as for the adventures, we played through Head Money, which is Deanna and I, and after getting over the initial shock of the gory descriptions in the story, we, and learning we can never play this with our kids, we did have a good time with this adventure. The fact these short adventures featuring three checks instead of just one is a nice change from the, the core game short adventure and made it feel more like a story. And it made it feel like those checks mattered a lot more than, ooh, you start with a fate point or ooh, you draw an extra card. There was a lot more involved in this. It also featured a neat mechanic where how you did on those checks made a direct impact on how many henchmen you had to face in the final battle. This is a nice touch. And that's one thing about Aventuria that's often been missing from this sort of game is actual impact moving forwards mm. from the non-combat aspect. Yes. So next we played for Selmian Delusions. This was with five players, including Sean here, as well as Tori and Kat. Now the combat in this adventure was interesting as it had a new twist that made the start of the combat even harder than any other fight we have fought. Now, part of this involved a new environmental card mechanic, as well as the player actions that were in play, and there were multiples. Now, I don't want to spoil anything here. This one is definitely interesting, and I, I really appreciate the work that goes into making each Aventuria combat unique. Again, th this, like every other time I've played the game, was just straight up an enjoyable experience with a bit of game stress, but not <laughs> too much that it overwhelmed just having fun at the table with it with your group now finally deanna and i went through the full forest of no return story now one thing that really amused me about this is the other two adventures are set in the forest and the forest seems like this brutal difficult spooky place with all these terrible things happening well the forest itself doesn't play much of a role here uh your first combat actually happens once you're through the forest so i almost recommend if you are going to play through this just to get the story impact of how scary this place is to play through the short adventures first, just so you can realize how deadly the forest is. And it just, that way when you're like, wow, we made it through the forest, now what's gonna happen? Now the new environment cards are used to full effect in this adventure. Um, this is a three act adventure that uses the new event deck and it uses the leader action deck. So sorry, they're not the new event deck and the leader action. It uses the event deck, which will have new cards in it and the leader action deck that will have new cards in it. Now, one other mechanic I liked during this was that the skill checks, in addition to having a mix of you pick who makes the check, so you're going to pick whoever has the highest stat, and everyone makes the check, there were actually a few where the entire group rolls, but it, there were additional results. So if everyone failed the test, you all just have to try again. Or if everyone failed, this is going to happen. Or if one person fails, but everyone else succeeds, that's going to impact the combat. And I thought that was really neat. It actually reminded me of skill challenges in 4th Ed D&D, the way you're kind of getting checks and Xs, and depending on how many people pass, actually made an impact, instead of everyone who passes gets a fate, and everyone who fails loses a fate or draws a card or something. Yet another variance from what they could have easily gotten away with as bare minimum effort. They really aren't just phoning in these adventures with a fresh plot slapped onto a default progress system. Oh, I agree. And for the fact, like, yes, it's kind of rope. Every adventure is three checks, then a fight. You kind of get that feel. Those checks are so different and their impacts are so different. And to be honest, I should have been saying three checks, but like it might be a check, but you may have to redo a couple of them. So it could be more than three. Now, as for the forest and return, the story was excellent. Um, again, as I mentioned, this was much more family friendly than the two short adventures. The combats were particularly challenging. Um, in one act, we were both down to under 10 hit points by the fifth round, and after sneaking in a victory, we then totally failed the next act completely. Which leads me to something I don't think we've actually mentioned in our previous Aventuria content, losing an adventure. So when you lose an adventure, you stop. You're just done. You lose any reward cards you've earned, and you reset your decks back to base. 
then it's just done. You're you finished. It doesn't matter what act you're on. If it was the end of act one, you're done at the end of act one. End of act two, you're done at the end of act two. End of act three, you're just done. You can then try again, but you're starting back at act one with a new set of characters or perhaps the same characters, but reset to the zero level, like reset to everything. Of course, keeping any previous experience earned in other stories, because that's the whole adventure of thing. Now, even the story is written that you fail, but another group came in after you and completed what you started, which I thought was somewhat encouraging. Like I read it and like, we're going to be that next group. Now, the important part to note here is that if you fail a specific act, you don't, by the book, get to retry just that act. You've got to start entirely over, which thematically makes sense. But which I can see could be frustrating to some people, but really make, just makes for more gameplay in the long run. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what we're here for? Now, we, of course, learned this through experience, which led to another interesting observation of how different the exact same adventure can be due to the random nature of the cards and the dice. This is a draw cards from a deck game, shuffle the decks, and roll a lot of dice. For the act we failed, our second attempt was almost a cakewalk. It went extremely well. We could have finished with three time left, with neither of us ever knocked out, or even under 10 health if the dice had been just a little bit happier. Just a little bit. One more crit, probably, and we could have finished it with three time left. Now, the big change, of course, were which events came up. There is one combination of a new event and a specific lieutenant that is devastating if it happens. The odds of this are pretty slow. There's, there's only one of those events in the 10 cards. Um, so that was big. The henchmen we had out made a big difference and possibly even more so what we rolled for the enemy to do. I, again, I'm, I'm being as vague as possible because I really don't want to spoil it. Um, if I mention what was happening, it, it really does kind of ruin this. But there were certain results on the enemy card that seemed a little un unbalanced isn't the right word. But you don't want them to come up. In that first fight, they came up often. It's, it's wonderful because the variety of henchmen, for instance, increases with every new yes. set you add. So you are if you buy a new game and then come back and try Forest again, it might be a whole yes. different adventure all again with things you've never seen in the game in that in that adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Now, that said, the adventures we did win followed the typical Adventuria roller coaster. Um, I would almost call it like the the, um, uh, the loop, of, the play loop you get from a game of Adventuria, because we've now played in multiple games, I think over 10 different adventures I've completed now. You definitely got the, what the heck, how are we going to win this? We've got no chance. Look at this enemy. Look at that. And I have no cards. And what am I going to do? Two, two, three rounds in, we're like, oh my God, we're almost dead. We're doomed. There's no way we're going to make that. To wait, wait, I've got some defense now. I'm starting to do more. We might just have that. To ah, we crushed that. That was fantastic. You see how much damage I did that last turn? We definitely seem, tend to see that curve, except in the one where we got utterly destroyed. Yeah. And it's, it's this curve balance of increasing hero ability with the converse villain weakening. Yeah. It's just been so well done in these adventures. Yeah, every game feels tense and stressful. Now, some of the other small bits I didn't get to mention yet just because they didn't really fit in was the new reward cards are welcome. Um, they're, this is a forest. The, the henchmen tend to be animal specific. And well, you get some rewards that particularly work rather well in this adventure if you're lucky enough and come up getting to that random factor again um the large number of new animal keyword henchmen you get in this is significant i have not verified it but i think all 22 of the new henchmen are animals of some type now there are forest animals there are underground animals there are undersea animals but they're all animals you also get a new henchman type which is called swarms now, Swarms is another new mechanic added in this game, though I have seen them in other expansions as well, but they were introduced in this. Again, we kind of played things out of order. Now, Swarms tend to have low hit points, but you put three counters on them, representing the size of the Swarm. When you reduce a Swarm to zero hit points, instead of killing it and removing it from the game and getting a fate point, you instead just remove a counter. Now, the big thing about Swarms are is it might only have three hit points, while any additional damage is lost. So you pull out your giant, I turned into a tiger attack with Orin, or sorry, with uh, Hilbert, and you do 2d6 plus 2 damage and pull out a big 14 points of damage, well, you only kill one rat. You only remove one token. Now, the swarm is killed when the last counter is removed. Now, these rewards and henchmen, along with the new event and leader cards, are all great additions to your growing Aventuria collection. 
These are all cards I would welcome randomly showing up in future games. As Sean mentioned earlier, every expansion set adds to it, which is another part of the expansion I liked. The fact that this was not standalone. This merged with everything else we owned. So when setting up various combats in these adventures, we often saw a mix of old and new cards. So while one fight might have animals, it might also, say, have guards. So you're going to mash up all your guards and all your animals. Unlike, say, in the Veil Dancer Hero pack, where the included adventure made sure you only saw the new hirelings. This one gets mixed in. It presents new things along with the old, which I got to say, it's an abstract card game, but it made the Dark Eye world feel more real and more alive. We have constantly applauded the meat that you get in these games that really improve what you have to work with with every single box you open. Now, one final note that I haven't touched on, having a new hero also means you get a lot more cards, 30 new cards to customize your existing heroes. And if only playing with four heroes, you now have one spare deck you can cannibalize to improve your other heroes. Because we talked about that before, where there is a deck building, sorry, deck construction mechanic done before you play. While getting Hilbert, you have many new cards, including the invocations and new abilities for him, but he also has many copies of some of the more popular cards, specifically cards that buff all three of the different attack types. Those are cards I can easily see, like stealing for our Bosch, getting an extra copy of a, um, I can't remember the card that gives you plus three to your uh, melee attacks, but I would totally see you stealing that card and throwing it in. We know you deck constructors love your options. So overall, there's a lot to like in Forest of No Return for Adventuria, and I have very few complaints. Sure, some of the non-mechanical components of the game have different finish, but it doesn't impact anything. My only real concern is making sure your group is aware of the nature of the two short adventures and the content they contain. This isn't high fantasy. This is grim, dark fantasy with tones and themes to match. Interestingly, though, the main three-act adventure does avoid these potential pitfalls, and I would say goes far enough to be family-friendly. The new character, Hilbert of Iwan, is an excellent hero and lots of fun to play and manages to feel very different from every other hero we own. The included adventures are well-written and engaging, and we've been continually impressed by what the writers have done with Adventuria to make each combat unique and interesting. And Forest No Return continues to bring more of the same. Honestly, if you own Adventuria and enjoy the cooperative adventure mode, you should just pick up a copy of Forest No Return. The new hero's great, the new adventures are even more involved and engaging than those in the base set. With this box, you're actually getting more story than you did in the original, and you're getting a new hero to play through them with. Added to that, you're getting new events, leaders, and henchmen cards that can make the initial adventures more interesting and variable, adding to the replayability of the base box. Heck, even if you choose not to play the two mini-adventures to avoid problematic content, you're still mm -hmm. ahead picking up this for everything else it contains. Now, where I'm on the fence is whether or not players who play adventure in dual mode would want this set. While we have heard that that's not the most popular way to play the game, I'm sure there's people out there that love the one-on-one -on -one combat or group mass melees. For the cost, you're going to get a lot of cards you won't be able to use, right? All the adventure stuff is wasted. What you do, though, get is a new, very solid hero worth using on their own, worth customizing, or just worth cannibalizing to make your current heroes better. Now, for those of you still listening who haven't played Adventuria, what are you waiting for? This continues to be our favorite adventure card game published to date. And again, I have to thank Ulysses Spiel for introducing us to the Adventuria game world and my first glimpse at the Dark Eye. Well, that's it for our review of Forest of No Return from the Adventuria Adventure Card Game. I invite you to also check out Mo's written review of this game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Table Talk, Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, I got a, I got a few to get through here. Uh, I don't know how much I'm going to say about each, but first up was Land vs. Sea. Um, totally planned on reviewing that today, but unfortunately a huge sale at Amazon launched on Sunday, which I had to cancel one of our planned gaming events. 
Uh, plus things we, we almost fit in one game, but there was an oven problem too. So there, there was a cooking issue that combined with that. So we did not get this played three players. So that's my big thing is I mean, I have to play this three player before we review it, but I did get to try it four player, multiple plays. Um, in addition to playing four player, uh, we also tried out the caravan scoring rules, which adds end game scoring. And I gotta say for a four player cooperative game, it played really well. Like, like, Playing Carcassonne with four-player teams doesn't sound interesting, but it worked really well in this tally in the game. And there's this thing where you put out a token at the end of your turn, and anyone who completes the, can I say mass? I don't know, like, like land or sea that it's on, scores a bonus point, and then the token goes back to the owner. Well, when you're playing four players, you are not allowed to talk to the other player about what they should do or what you should do. You also... Wow, we just suddenly started breaking up. Hopefully that no one else saw that. It was short. Oh, wow. We, yeah, no, we went red there yeah. on my... That's why I said everything just went to crap, so I'm pausing yeah. to see if we come it's, back. It's back green now. All right. I don't know what just happened there, but I'm like, I noticed it because everything started being jerky. Yeah, just all of a sudden I look over and I'm saying, like, it's red. <laughs> all right. Well, it's not like we're going to publish this on YouTube separately or anything else, so we'll keep going. Um, So... What you can do, though, is you're not allowed to say, and all the tiles are two-sided. So you can't show the, yeah, so these saying we actually went silent for about 20 count. So you also can't show your opponents the other sides of your tiles. So that's secret information. So what these counters end up doing is kind of a, a non-verbal cue. Like a, either I'm going to close this, or you should close this, or hey, look over here. And that actually worked really well. Like, like I, I read it and I was like, eh, I don't know. But once you actually play with that mechanic, it was actually well done. Like the, the being able to put those tokens out was pretty cool. And by the end of the game, probably scored us each like 10 to 12 points. So it wasn't an insignificant amount of points. Yeah, and it's, it's funny because as soon as you said we're not allowed to talk after mentioning these tokens, I immediately went, oh, okay, I know what these tokens are for. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's a total obvious Yes. gameplay component but then trying to figure out if the person saying leave this alone i want to go there or please close that off made it interesting but a huge part of that game that, that you might not see the first time you play but if we're your experienced players you're probably going to catch it is looking what other people have and the other thing is there's another step to that where you see what can be drafted next but again only one sides of the tiles so when you when when tori puts his counter there and i look and i can see right in front of him he's got something to close that I'm like, okay, he doesn't need me to close it. Whereas if he doesn't, then I'm like, does he want me to close it or does he have something on the other side, right? That, that just kind of the thought processes. And it, it is impossible to actually be nonverbal because you get the, ah, oh, you know, like you can't help it sometimes. So, so we probably stretch the rules a bit. Now, the other thing we tried was the caravan scoring, which I found weird. So every time you put a caravan or a trading ship next to an existing one, you score two points. And then at the end of the game, you look at the groups of trading ships and caravans. And if there's more ships, the C player gets one point per thing in that caravan and trading route. And then if there's more caravans, they get one point per everything in that trading route. Which seemed neat and interesting, but all of those tiles came up to being in the game. We just ended up with one massive area that was worth a ton of points. So I don't know. I, it's just, I'm going to try to spread them out more. And it added a lot of counting. Like when we're playing, it's like, all right, we're up by one or we're up by one kind of fighting back and forth, which in a way is interesting. Now, what I did appreciate was end game scoring because I liked that there was now end game scoring. It wasn't just look over the scoreboard and that's who wins. I did like having to calculate that. But one of the problems we are finding with Land versus Sea, and I'm sorry, great, good games publishing, is scoring can be a pain. But what we actually ended up doing is I have lots of extra bits from games I've upgraded. So I have lots of cubes. So I grabbed the cubes from Lords of Waterdeep, which I've replaced with D&D &D, D &D pulls. And what we did is we marked them. So we put all the caravans in orange and all of the trade routes in purple, and we could much easier see which tiles were connected. And we've been tempted to do that just when you complete a land. Make sure you don't double count the tile. Like, it should be easy. One, two, three, four, five. But you're like, one, two, three, four, five. But it wraps around. And did I count that tile already? And I got to say, the game kind of needs some way. And, like, it's easy enough to, to grab something around, pennies, coins. If you're a gamer, you probably got stuff that's out there. Or even something that keeps track of how big the caravans are. Though I realize that takes some of the strategy out. 
because you're trying to are they paying attention or not is kind of gone so i don't know what i will say is that it played really solid four player i was impressed by how well it played four players so two and four players fantastic game scoring can be a bit annoying what i really need to try now though is the third player that is the cartographer who you have to use those other scorings so cartographer is the only one who scares scores trade routes is, is I think, no, it's if there's a tie. Sorry, if there's just as many boats as caravans, the cartographer scores the points. And they're the only player that scores coral reefs and mountains, which is something we didn't even explain when we played four players. I didn't even touch that scoring method. So overall, land versus sea, enjoying it. But man, it can be kind of annoying counting up the points. Right. Next, another four-player experience that is Super Mother Load, which I now learned is an app that has been converted to a board game. It isn't actually just a version of Dig Dug. It's an app game that has been converted to a board game that some people feel similar to Dig Dug, which was interesting to learn. Um, Sean Hamilton pointed that out, not Sean from Hamilton, because he loved the app back in the day. And what was funny is I pointed out that I'm like, it's neat. It's interesting. I've had some fun with it, but I don't know how much I love it. And he's like, yeah, that's kind of how I felt about for the app. I was obsessed with it for a little while, and it kind of went away. Now, what I will say is it was way better with four players than with two. With two players, we earned every possible achievement. We went through the deck. We were just doing too many combos, and there was a runaway leader problem. Whoever started buying their cards first and getting them into their deck just blew away the other player because once you had the better cards, you had the better deck, and it just kind of steamrolled. With four players, we didn't see that at all. Um, the board fills up quick. Now, with four players, you do add another level of depth, so you're playing more boards overall. But there was definitely like um, way more people using nice big drills to just drill standard dirt because all the good stuff was taken. So that was kind of interesting. There was more fight over the artifacts. And I got to say, the game's way better with four. Honestly, when I played it with two, I was at the maybe we can get rid of this level. Now that I played it with four, I want to keep it a bit longer and try it maybe with three players, maybe get it out to a public play event before getting rid of it. But with two players, I don't think I'll ever play two players again. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. You can play this one to four player couch co op on uh, Steam, which is probably it now. Is it the this version or is it the app that it's based on? Uh, it's the it's the app. It's the original. Now I don't know how the app is it the uh, the original deck builder. Like, is that even part of it, or is it something else? I haven't tried the app, so I don't know. Um, hard to I, I don't know enough about it yet. I'm yeah, sure just yeah. All right, fair enough. Next was a bit of a mess. We tried out. This didn't happen. This is a prototype game that showed up. A um, bunch of like drive through cards, quality cards showed up in a box. And then two weeks later, the instructions showed up in the biggest, most overdone box for seven instructions I've ever seen. The instructions, sorry, it's called That Did Not Happen. Do I have the wrong name? Oh, I have the right name. This didn't happen. All right, I have the right name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the rule book is like a short novel. Um, it's even published in a little soft cover book that's a little hard to read. Um, read through it. It sounded interesting, but just trying to set up was difficult. We were having a hard time figuring it out. Um, there's a time machine you're moving from, and then you're moving out on the board. It didn't feel like you could do enough on your turn. Um, there was a thing where time progressed where your things should shift. Um, we spend all this time trying to figure it out. There's a gender swapping, but for some reason it switches all your skills, even though you're the same person, but your gender swap, which seemed kind of strange. You figure your skills would say the same. Um, it's non-voluntary when you gender swap and we couldn't even figure out when it happened. I think it happened anytime the timeline changed when you were on it. I don't know. Um, I had to reread the rules while playing. Deanna tried to read the rules while playing and we just felt kind of lost. Um, eventually we did change something in the timeline but we did it in the, so there's three eras you play through and we did it in the first era, like the third card in the timeline. And that caused a chain reaction that caused four apocalypses. And that was our first play experience. And I don't know if we just shouldn't have changed that, if we're misunderstanding things. So what I did is I went on a bit of a hunt looking for a how to play video or some reviews to try to get more info and I'm not finding anything out there yet. Yeah. So this one's going to need some work. It might mean sitting down, writing up an email, sending it to the designer, which I'm trying to avoid doing free play testing anymore. So, well, I, interestingly, I'm, I'm, there is no designer listed on Board Game Geek. I'm sure yeah. you know who it is through your contact, but they don't even have a design. There's no forum. There are no reviews. Yeah. There's no designer. There's nothing 
about this yeah. game on board game geek not even a cover image yeah like I, I just i need to see a video that tells me how to flip the card when the timeline changes and i want to see that chain of events so this one's looking rough um i i we, we do over review on this one i'll try to get to it maybe we'll have to house rule some stuff maybe we just didn't understand something i've asked deanna to take some time to read through the rules before we play again i got to give this one more of a shot i'm not saying it's horrible yet it's definitely got some interesting ideas um it's the timeline thing seems neat the the chain reaction seemed neat but the way everything chained felt broken like it just we flipped one card and everything fell apart now maybe that's a point what i've been trying to figure out is how long the game's supposed to be it kind of seems like it's supposed to be a lot shorter than i expect it to be and i think that was something when i got pitched the game that i was like huh time travel game that can be played in 15 minutes and i have a feeling that might be all it is it's just a, oh we made a mistake the world ends let's play again 15 to 60 minutes is the listed well spread. ours was in the 15 because <laughs> it was hard to change the timeline like you had to go like just at the start of your turn you either go to a spot on the timeline or you go back to the thing then you could do one thing that one thing is to collect stuff you need to be able to collect stuff to flip to change the timeline well some of the timeline things require you to collect three things and it was just like the amount of time that was taking and the whole time our time machine kept moving towards the apocalypse. It just didn't feel like we had enough time. But again, I need to sit down with the rule book, Listen with the cards book. in front of me, like Sean said when we were talking about our main topic, and try to figure out what we missed. Or if we didn't, basically write the design and go, is it supposed to play like this? Like, it, it's hard to tell what the intent was. So there is an animated tutorial on the westboundgame.com website. Okay, I'll have to watch that and see. That, that is a, a YouTube link. It's about two, two and a half minutes. And okay. that may help you with the card flip. Just, yeah, just that, that might explain it. the one thing. Because one of the things Deanna noticed is that the flip of the actual card had an opposite event, right? So it'd be like the Titanic sinks, the Titanic makes it to port. But right. that's not an exact thing. But that's not how the game works. When you show the timeline, it's the card underneath that comes on top which is something completely different that has nothing to do with the time, right. the Titanic. And it seems like it should be, well, the Titanic sinks or it didn't when you change the timeline, not the Titanic sinks. Oh, we've developed cattle farming. Like it was just, there was a disconnect there, but I think that's the only way it would work because otherwise you'd just be flipping the same symbols around the front of the card. I don't know. It's going to take some work to, to review this one. So, so I got to say initial thoughts aren't great. Uh, theme still seems neat and it's definitely doing things different um, my whole thing with the two card things does just make me think why not just have one card that flips over I'm, I'm not like it's a neat idea and I think they might have went with it as a look at this neat thing but it might just be added level of complexity and fiddliness that's not needed I don't know more plays might help I will definitely check out that video yeah so that's at uh, westboundgame.com slash this dash didn't dash happen next a new game, another new game. So this didn't happen, was it was brand new off the pile of obligation. This one comes off my pile of shame, but many years ago at, I'm trying to blank. I want to say Game Crafter, that's not it. It's in London. Um, it is a store on the second floor. It's on Dundas and I'm totally blanking on the name of it. So sorry, you don't get your shout out because I stink. You can't remember the name of it. I'm picture the place. Anyway, they had a, a commission section. A, a You could buy used games, and they took a credit, and then the money went, and I picked up Star Trek Expeditions with the expansion for 20 bucks. Had it all this time. It's a WizKids Games publication, probably long out of print, as many games we talk about are, where it is a cooperative Star Trek game based on the new Star Trek series. The, the um, what is it, Chris Pine, I think is his name, as Kirk, right? And that that Star Trek set after the first movie possibly leading up like telling you some story in between the next movie but we're not sure on that now the most fascinating thing about this game and what made me buy it is that it is designed by rainer nitzia which is a famous game designer that has designed many math-based games that i enjoy and i wanted to see what the heck is he going to do yes the game changer thank you very much esquire jjr yes it was the game chamber in london ontario so this is a game where you have the Enterprise in space, you have a Klingon battlecruiser, a D7 battlecruiser coming in to attack it, and you have the planet below that you're going to seed with exploration sites and discovery tokens. Now, this game uses hero clicks figures, but they're not hero clicks compatible, which Sean's experienced that in another game. So it's a way to have it so that your characters take damage, their stats change. 
Same with the ship. You have an Enterprise and you have the thing. They're fully pre-painted. And I got to say, they look pretty good. Now, the expansion has three more characters in it, which you can freely swap in and out. On your turn, you're going to go down to the planet. You're going to flip over one of the cards. And then you're going to pandemic-like use action points to do things. Now, interestingly, this is done by flipping up an event at the start of your turn that tells you how many actions you have and then can have other bad things happen. Time can progress. And if enough time runs out, the Klingon battle fleet shows up and wipes you out. The Klingon ship can attack, or you could have special rules like your transporters aren't working this round. We played on the easiest difficulty. Once you get down on the planet, what you're trying to do is complete three different missions. So what you quickly learn, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil this one because it's not like it's a campaign game. There's one story. Every time you play, you get the same story. Basically, you showed up on the planet. You were supposed to show up and say, hey, welcome to the Federation. Instead, you show up and like, eh, we don't know about joining the Federation. Well, it ends up the Klingons got to them. So there's a civil war about to happen. There's Klingons trying to convince them to join the Klingon Empire instead of the Federation. And then there's, I forget what the other plot is. You might remember. There's a third plot that you're trying to figure out. Something to do with artifacts on the planet. Oh, there's an energy crisis. That's what it is. Sorry. There's an energy crisis. The planet's going to die if we don't save the energy crisis. And you move your characters down and you do things and you can get these tokens. But everything you try to resolve is dice and math. So what it contains is 2d6, where the sixes are replaced by sevens, which I thought was an interesting probability curve. But if you roll a seven, you take a click of damage. So you strain yourself. When you're trying to do a thing, there will be three different types of skills. So I'm going to forget what they are. There's like engineering, ops, and combat, or whatever the three main skills. You then go to the problem. You look at your click to see how good you are at it. So like Kirk has a 14 in combat. Spock has a 14 in science. You then add the dice to it and see if you beat the total to complete the event. Added to that are energized cards that give you crew, and the crew are of the three different types, red, blue, and yellow suits, that give you bonuses to those roles. So it really feels like Star Trek. You're up on the ship, you assemble an away team, you beam down to the planet, you find the problem, you get plus two points for every character that joins you, and you might want to work together to do things, you might want to split up. And it did a great job of making me feel like I was part of a Star Trek story. Now, the problem is, it's going to be the same story next time I play. You're going to mix up where things are. You could try in the higher difficulty, but again, all it's going to do is make the Klingons attack quicker or make the time run out quicker. And interestingly, each of the three things you're trying to solve have a branching path. So it's a, did you pass fail the first one? Goes this way or this way. Then it's, did you pass, pale the other one? So there's actually four different endings for each of the three tracks you're working on. So there is replayability there, but every time you're arriving on this planet, there's a civil war, there's an energy crisis, and the Klingons are trying to convert them to their side while you're fighting a D7 battlecruiser in space. So that's never going to change. So while it was an awesome experience the first time, we had a great time playing it, I don't have a real strong urge to play again. And I looked at the extra characters, and I'm like, now you can play Sulu, check. The original game is uh, Spock, Bones, Kirk, and Uhura. The expansion is Chekhov, Chekhov, Sulu, I'm forgetting who, and Scotty are the, the three bonus characters you can get. But like, there's no real, you just have different skills and you're better at different skills. Like there's no change to the story. So I didn't see any need to try the other characters. And honestly, like that's pretty much my full review. Like I could play this a couple more times. I don't think there's anything left to discover in this game Despite the fact there's four different possible endings for each one, do I need to see them? I could just read the cards. So interesting game. If you're a Star Trek fan, it's worth checking out. But man, the math gets to be a bit much. Like you're sitting there, you're like, I need a 20. Well, one of them is like, I need a 22 plus. But if I roll 26 plus, I get this bonus. And if I roll 29 plus, I get this. So you're like, all right, I've got a 10 on my dial. And I have the skill athletics, so that gives me a plus two. And Kirk's with me, which gives me plus two. And I'm going to play this card from my hand to give me plus two. And there's a character here that's plus one, and a character that's plus one, and a character that's plus two. Oh, wait, this character also has athletics, so I get another plus two. And then we have a counter that gets a plus three on a science. Like, And then you're like, oh, wait, wait, what am I at? Like, that happens so many times when we were playing. And, and again, I'm like, I just pointed to Nizzy on the box. I'm like, Kat and Tori don't know that name, but I'm like, yeah, this is, it, it's very much a Nizzy again. Yeah, this one, I mean, one, yes, it is out of print. You can still find bits of it around. You, you can probably actually find the expansion easier than the mm -hmm. original game these days. Uh, the expansion is still actually listed by somebody on Amazon.com at a reasonable price. Oh. Uh, the game itself is not. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but uh yeah it's i mean it, is, it does not have a great rating the uh the promo card that gives you a triple adventure is actually higher rated than the that game sounds itself neat. Uh, Dude, that um, sounds cool so there's a triples promo pack but yeah i mean the game is only rated 6.5 um it is leaning towards six i would say based on yeah the actual numbers um it's yeah, you know, if you're a real Star Trek fan, I can absolutely see oh, yeah. wanting this in your collection, a hundred percent. But beyond that, it's it's a game. <laughs> to be honest, like there's there there are very various Star Trek games out there, right? So if you want big galactic people are exploring planets, finding new worlds, you know, doing all that, totally asymmetric. If you're the Federation, you're exploring, trying to colonize, you're the Klingons, you're trying to kill people, if you're the Ferengi, you're trying to take advantage of everyone. You play Star Trek Ascendants. Many people call it Star Trek in a box. What you don't get out of that game, there's no away missions. There's no, you are just doing that. If you want the other side of Star Trek, the build the team, go to the planet, use the right skills, pick up the right stuff around the planet, collect the artifacts before making your check, this is the game you want to play. What I almost want to do is combine the two, but man, that'd be horrible. <laughs> like, but like some epic game where like every planet was a different one. This game, I think, would probably bump up at least a point if they put out expansion. Because it'd be so simple. It would just be another set of tiles and cards. Like, yes, your planet would still be the same blue text, but there's nothing on the board. Like, it's just a bunch of areas. There's no reason it couldn't be a different planet. And throw in a, a, a board cube as a new clicks, right, to make it interesting. There is no reason. Like if I there was an expansion, I would happily play this game again. But playing it again, you know what? I'm going to keep it in my collection for now. Um, it's a sci-fi game. Sean hasn't played for one. <laughs> Might enjoy it. But yeah, it was neat. I, I had a great time doing it, but I don't know if I'd want to play it. I'm very glad I found it for $20 used. We'll just say that. Yeah, this is a 2012 game. This, or, yeah, the, it's not The new. expansion is 20. The original game is 2011. The expansion was 2012. And that was the last thing that's come out yeah it's it, it's not the fact that WizKids still has a page on it is that's impressive, impressive actually yeah uh, I, although I their how to play video done. is no longer available <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> that's fine we should record one yeah all right next i want to talk about adventuria so so we squeezed this one in under the wire we had plans to play certain games it just didn't work out right it's been a, it's been a very busy week so a couple things i want to note that i didn't want to throw into the review because i felt it was a little interesting first off we lost First time we lost in Adventuria, which is something we didn't actually cover in a previous review. And we lost harsh. Like, it, it, it didn't feel at all close. And, man, I don't know what I think about the reset. Like, the reset fits. It makes sense. Like, it's a, it's a three-act story. If you die in Act 2, you don't get to play Act 3, especially based on a role-playing game, right? If you're playing a role-playing game, it's not going to be like, all right, now your character's brother shows up. Let's try again. Now, I guess what we could have done is started at act two because there's no reason you couldn't but you wouldn't have the rewards but you know what the rewards is one card and if you start at act two you're cheating you start with 40 health instead of 30 so that's a big thing and that's one of the things i almost wonder with the, the adventure design if they take that into account that you're probably going to start damaged in the future adventures so what we ended up doing is we cheated we literally just used the same characters, played through it again, started from scratch, kept our rewards from Act 1, started with our health, like did it as if we finished Act 1 successfully and just played again. We house ruled it. We were like, this is, I just want to replay the adventure because I want to review it. I want to know how it turns out. So yeah, it, it was interesting. Now, one thing I will say, once a character dies, so many of the adventure adventures, the end, what you lose is a character's knocked out, take a skull and crossbones token. Once enough skull and crossbone tokens have been taken equal to the number of characters you lose. So what that generally means with two players is either you each die once or one of you dies twice, or sorry, is knocked out twice. So that's, a, that's not in every, like there are other ones where you could keep playing. You could both be knocked out and still like one of you still complete the adventure. But the overall most common way to lose is that. Well, we had someone knocked out for the first time and I got to say it is hard to bring someone back. So one of the things is you can heal them for five or more in one shot. I can't do that with Hilbert. Hilbert has two awesome healing cards that go into play and you can tap them every turn, but they only heal two. And that's not in one shot. So even if I like tap both, that's still only four for one, but even then it wouldn't count because it's not in one shot. So the only other thing you can do is try to revive, which is tap as many endurance cards as you want 
Roll a d20, and if it's under the number of cards you tap, the person gains that much health. Ooh. Wow. Even worse, and this is the rule I'm, I question, you can't use fate. Why not? Mm, yeah. I didn't like that can't use fate. So D dies. I only had eight endurance at the time. I failed to roll. I rolled 15. Then that character doesn't exist on the bad guy's turn. Everyone then targets me. There's no way I could live. A question that came up that I could not find an answer online for is does the number of characters symbol mean number of characters alive, like not unconscious? So like if the bad guy says it goes once per character, if one character is knocked out, does it go two times still if you're playing with two people? We played it that way because every time I could see it's a number of characters. Nowhere did it say number of awake characters, number of current characters, number of not knocked out characters. It just says number of characters, and we started with two characters. We had a wolf that attacks twice, and a, another thing that attacks twice, and the main bad lieutenant that attacked twice, all targeting me. And yes, I had like 18 health at this time. No, not even close. With the five dodge, like I said, Hilbert's very fragile. It did not work. Then when we played through the second time, we managed to... Uh, I don't want to spoil it. I was trying <laughs> to decide. What, one of the things the lieutenant can do to make the combat more difficult just didn't happen because of the dice. And because of that, it was almost a cakewalk. Like I said, we came really close to finishing with three time left, which is a huge amount for most of these games. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, I'm very tempted to house rule both the just retry. Like this isn't an RPG. It's a board game. You're supposed to have fun. Because I got to admit, I, especially for wanting to review the game, I didn't want to go back and play Act 1 again. Yeah, I, I can see for a review why you would absolutely do that. Although again, like as I said in the review, you just get more play. I, I don't I think it's all that right. bad to go back and do it all over again but you're trying to get through it all so you can review it yeah so. exactly next up actually d's got a few things let's see if we can add this so so we were getting beat to crumbs and i was saying no i'll be fine this is adventuria this is the roller coaster we're about mm -hmm. to start coming back which we totally affected we're like nope wow i'm actually unconscious um and yeah like so it's 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 late in the game. You have like ten endurance, not so bad. But then, boom! Bad guy went twice. Ten health gone. Mm -hmm. Like I even had the healing up. I was healing two a turn, and it did nothing in that particular fight. Yeah. Just keeps getting more convoluted. Yes, these cards go with it. So yeah, here's 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 one thing I didn't mention in the review about inventory overall. How the heck do you sort this stuff? Like I honestly, like, no, I'm not talking about physically, but there is now a monster that causes infected wounds. When you put the monster in play, you put the infected wound card under the monster. The infected wound card is a unique card that doesn't belong with any other cards. <laughs> so when I'm putting my game away, where the heck do I put the infected wound card? Do I put it in the henchman deck along with the monster so that I remember when I draw that monster, I have to draw the card? Do I now have a pile of special cards I might need in some games? I would expect that there is probably a a separate section of unique cards. Yeah, I don't know. And there are two of those. There, there were two infected wound cards in the game because I think there's two of that particular thing. I don't think that's a spoiler that there's a new effect. <laughs> but yeah, that's a new effect in the game too, right? Now you have a card where a thing happens underneath it and something happens when the first time you get hit. There were actually multiple things where the first time you get hit, something happens. Right. But just organizing it. And now we have environments. Where do I put environment? Well, the environments actually have the story names on them. So they yeah. just, to me, go in the story deck. But yeah. if I wanted to use them in something else, so it's just, it's, it's getting more and more difficult to put the game away, which is going to make it more difficult to get to the table because now I have to sort through more stuff. Yeah. And I kind of hate that. Yep. Like, I'm almost thinking binders. You know how long it would take to take everything out? Oh, yeah, that's not good. You, right? You, like, you don't almost want, I mean, you could do the story stuff in binders. And well, that's unique, what I was thinking, is small and, binders and, and, and with the story binders, stuff. But then all the, the general gameplay stuff is all right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we put it away fine because it was just, let's put all the story stuff together. <laughs> let's put all the events together. Let's put all the things together. Yeah. That that's become an I don't know an issue with my growing adventuria collection, which is only going to get bigger. 
Uh, next up, I do want to shout out the new version of Patchwork. So it ends up, they have put out multiple versions of Patchwork. There's like an American version, a Christmas version, and Patchwork. And they all have the exact same tiles in them with different art. Well, the Halloween edition that was released this year actually rebalanced the tiles. Now, I haven't gone piece by piece. I don't know if there's new pieces or it's just the eyes on the pieces or the cost versus time on the pieces. But supposedly they rebalanced the game. And I don't know if I like it because so far I haven't been able to win a single game with this new set. So I don't know if they fixed it and I was just like really good at the old version or lucky or if they actually made it worse. Or conversely, I could have actually gotten better and finally started winning because I know how to play the game. That's now. true. But I'm not just playing with you. I'm also playing with Sean Hamilton and I haven't won a game Fair. with this new set. I'm like, what I need to do is challenge Sean Hamilton with the original set. Right. And if I can beat him with the original set, then then however they rebalanced it just doesn't work the way I play. I'm not saying it's broken, but I, and but as for the new art, when I first opened it, I'm like, wow, that pops. That's really clear. But then it's not. It's like hard to look at. It's really hard to look at. And I have found a couple of times where I have left gaps and not noticed. Oh, I haven't done that. And, and, and it's just like there's so many colors all in a row. And I, it's, you know. Oh, I could have put a patch there and saved myself a whole lot of hassle, but I didn't even notice that there was a patch there because there's just so much color vomited onto the screen. Yeah, and the two different player boards are different colors. I wonder if there's a, an advantage to playing one color over the other. Because I've never had that. I'm just wondering if it's the color I've been playing. It, it only happened once, but it was just, uh -huh. the, and maybe it was just the, that combination of that color player board and those two particular pieces yeah. next to each other. But yeah, it was, uh, it was a pain. I'll also admit I've been playing terrible lately because I'm playing in the middle of doing other stuff and not really thinking and just kind of taking moves. So you haven't seen it, but the games I've had with Sean Hamilton where I've like left it where I can't place anything, <laughs> like none of the tiles left on the table will fit on my board. And I'm like, what am I doing? I just <laughs> threw this game. Yeah, like the last, and, and I'm, and I am admittedly actually playing a lot with a lot more forethought than I had yes. originally. Uh, like the last game, I knew that I wouldn't be able to place the last piece, but it was okay because I had already taken a big enough lead. I'd right. already gotten the first to seven by seven. Yeah. So I was confident that I didn't need that last piece. Yeah, like the one game I played with them, I'm like, I should get the seven by seven, but the hole I left was unfillable. Oh <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> anyway. Right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right, the big one is land versus sea. I'd, I'd like to get that review by next week, but there is a lot going on. It is November. We are extremely busy in November, so I'm not going to promise anything. Um, there's still a lot to explore with that game. For for a literally two-minute-to-learn game, there's a lot going on. And Good Games Publishing specifically is looking for more reviews that highlight the three- and four-player. So I really do want to deep dive that. We did find it excellent four-player. I am surprised by how well it worked as a four-player game. That whole token thing is, like they said, Sean got it right away. It was brilliant. Um, but three player, I have no clue how that's going to play reading the book. Like absolutely zero clue how the cartographer is going to work. And I think you're going to need to be an experienced player to even throw that in. Like you're going to have to be used to the mountain and sea and, and reef scoring. And you're going to have to be used to the caravan scoring. So I need to play other games with those before I even feel like I want to try three players. So there's that. That's going to work a bit. Next is I still need to sit down with the kids and play Galaxy Trucker. Um, if they happen, a new sale launches, maybe we'll play it on Friday with Oceana. Um, it is limited to four players. So if we do have five on Friday, it won't work. But I think my kids are going to love this. I think my youngest is going to love the build the spaceship aspect. My oldest, I don't know. I have a feeling she might pull a Deanna and not be into it because of the random factor. Because she tends to like to plan ahead. So we'll see how that goes. And then I don't know if the kids don't like it, I'm going to have to find someone to play Galaxy Trucker with. Technically, I could review it. Right, because I played the original many, many times. I can tell you exactly how it's going to play out, but I really need to explore the new things. So the other thing is, I need to play with the kids multiple times because the new. Wow, I haven't had that happen in a long time. Who's sending me? Oh, D, come on, <laughs> you know better. <laughs> Terrible. I don't mute for whatever. Anyway, <laughs> so yes, Galaxy Trucker. Um, the thing is, the way the rules are presented, it's like. And it's always been like this. It's like, do this short run. Now do a second run with these new rules. And then here's the full game rules if you want to use them. So like, I almost feel like I need to play five times. Well, these five runs 
even fully experience the game. So we'll see how that goes. And then, well, I need to figure out this didn't happen, right? It's pile of obligation. I need to sit down with that rule book. And again, maybe contact the designer with some questions. I'm glad you did find that video. So that might answer some of the stuff. And I just, I, I have a feeling I'm thinking, I'm, I'm diving too hard into this. That it really is that fragile and it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to mess up the timeline. But I definitely, before we play that again, which it, it, we need to play it now, it also seems like it might be way better with one or two players than it was with four. With four players, your your time machine starts off at only two health instead of eight. And I almost feel like the player count is meant to be lower. So that's another, I, I want to try it solo and I want to try it with Deanna. And then I got two stuff in boxes back there that I don't know what it is. So we'll see what's there. Actually, I do know what one of them is. I'll be shocked if it's more Aventuria, but I'm just wondering what else <laughs> I could be getting from Studio 2. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Matt Lichtenwaller. Thanks, Matt. Roger Malosh. Thanks, Roger. Zopi. Thank you. Brian Sheehan. Thanks, Brian. David Miller Jr., who we should probably change to something guy Dave. Thank you. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means our shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcaster, uh, podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. The other thing you can do that show your support that we would greatly appreciate is tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop where you can get some cool bonus stuff, bonus audio and other neat stuff. And, and uh, we're not no script November. We're not following the script November so far yet. Yeah, go to Patreon because, you know, look at the production quality we have here. Like, shouldn't this be worth a few pennies? Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight for the lobbyists. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the Pedo Suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for Brunch on YouTube. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.